So I hope you're well and happy wherever you are. Uh, my name is Georgia Bing and I am the author of Molly Moon's Incredible Book of Hypnotism, which is a book I wrote a while back. I wrote six more of those books. I'm going to put it over here underneath this amazing picture by an artist I've never met. He's called Joe Webb. He does really cool pictures. Um, and I'm going to read you Molly Moon's incredible book of hypnotism, chapter by chapter. So here we go. This is chapter one. Molly Moon looked down at her pink, blotchy legs. It wasn't the bath water that was making them mottled like spam. They were always that colour and so skinny. Maybe one day, like an ugly duckling turning into a swan, her knock-kneed legs might grow into the most beautiful legs in the world. Some hope. Molly leaned back until her curly brown hair and her ears were under the water. She stared at the fluorescent strip light above her, at the fly-filled yellow paint that was pe peeling off the wall, and at the damp patch on the ceiling where strange mushrooms grew. Water filled her ears and the world sounded foggy and far away. Molly shut her eyes. It was an ordinary November evening and she was in a shabby bathroom in a crumbling building called Hardwick House. She imagined flying over it like a bird, looking down at its grey slate roof and its bramble-filled garden. She imagined flying higher until she was flying down looking down on the hillside where Hardwick Village lay. Up and up she went until Hardwick House became tiny. She could see the whole of the town of Briarsville beyond it. As Molly flew higher and higher, she saw the rest of the country and now the coastline too, with sea on all sides. Her mind rocketed upwards until she was flying in space looking down at the earth. And there she hovered. Molly liked to fly away from the world in her imagination. It was relaxing. And often, when she was in this state, she'd feel different. She had this special feeling tonight, as if something exciting or strange was about to happen to her. The last time she'd felt special, she'd found a half-eaten packet of sweets on the pavement in the village time before she got away with watching two hours of television instead of one. Molly wondered what surprise would greet her this time. Then she opened her eyes and was back in the bath. Molly looked at her distorted reflection in the underside of the chrome tap. Oh dear, surely she wasn't as ugly as that? Was that pink lump of dough her face? Was that potato her nose? Were those small green lights her eyes? Someone was hammering downstairs. That was strange. No one ever mended anything here. Then Molly realised that the hammering was someone banging on the front door. Trouble. Molly shot up and hit her head on the tap. The banging outside was very loud now and came with a fierce bark. Molly Moon, will you open this door at once? If you don't, I'll be forced to use the master key. Molly could hear keys rattling on a ring. She looked at the level of her bath water and gasped. It was much too deep and well over the allowed level. She jumped up, pulling the plug out she d as she did, and reached for her towel. Just in time, the door swung open. Miss Addiston was in, and darting like an adder to the bathtub, her scaly nose wrinkling as she discovered the deep, draining water. She rolled up her crimpling sleeve and pushed the plug back in. As I suspected, she hissed. Intentional flouting of orphanish rules. Miss Addison's eyes glinted spitefully as she took a tape measure from her pocket. She pulled the metal strip out and, making excited slurping noises, as she sucked on her loose false teeth, she measured how far Molly's bath had gone over the red line painted around the bottom of the tub. Molly's teeth chattered. Her knees were now turning blue and blotchy. Despite an icy draught that was coming through a crack in the window pane, the palms of her hands began sweating, as they always did whenever she was excited or nervous. 
Miss Addiston shook the tape measure, dried it on Molly's shirt, then snapped it shut. Molly braced herself to face the wiry spinster who, with her short grey hair and her hairy face, looked more like a mister than a miss. Your bath is 30 centimetres deep, Miss Addison announced, allowing for the amount that has already been deceitfully run away while I was knocking at the door. I calculate that your bath was actually 40 centimetres deep. You know that baths are only supposed to be 10 centimetres deep. Your bath was four times that deep, so you have, in effect, used up your next four baths. Three baths. Three baths. You have used up your next three baths. So, Molly, you're forbidden to have a bath for the next three weeks. As for a punishment, Miss Addison picked up Molly's toothbrush. Molly's heart sank. She knew what was coming next, Miss Addison's favourite punishment. Miss Addison glared at Molly with her dull black eyes. Her face heaved in a monstrous way as her tongue dislodged her teeth and moved them around in her mouth before settling them back down on her gums. She thrust the toothbrush at Molly. This week you will be toilet monitor. I want the toilets spotless, Molly. And this is the brush you'll be using. And don't think you can get away with using the toilet brush because I'll be watching you. Miss Addiston gave one last satisfied suck on her teeth and left the room. Molly slumped down onto the side of the bath, so the something that she'd felt was going to happen tonight was simply trouble. She stared at her manky toothbrush, hoping that her friend Rocky would let her share his. As she picked at a loose thread on her grey, balding old towel, she wondered what was it like being wrapped up in a fluffy white towel like the ones in TV adverts. Softness is the sign, everyone feels fine. Wash your towels in cloud nine. Molly loved adverts. They showed how comfortable life could be, lifting her out of her world and into theirs. A lot of the ads were silly, but Molly had her favourites, which weren't. These ones were filled with her friends, friends who were always happy to see Molly whenever she visited them in her mind. Wrap yourself in luxury time, cloud nine. Molly was shaken from her towel daydream as the evening assembly bell rang. Molly winced. She was late, as always, always late, forever in trouble. Other kids called Molly accident zone or zono because she was clumsy, uncoordinated and accident prone. Her other nicknames were drono since people said Molly's voice made them want to fall asleep and bogey eyes because her eyes were dark green and close together. Only Rocky, her best friend and some of the younger orphans called her Molly. Molly! Molly! Across the corridor, which was now being stampeded by children rushing downstairs, Molly saw Rocky's dark brown face framed with black curls beckoning her to hurry. Molly grabbed her toothbrush and ran to the bedroom where she, which she shared with two girls called Hazel and Cynthia. As she crossed the corridor, two older boys, Roger Fibbin and Gordon Boyles, ran into her and pushed her roughly aside. Get out of the way, Zono. Move it, Drono. Quick, Molly said Rocky, who was shoving his feet into his slippers. We can't be late again. Addison will have a fit. Mind you, then, he added, she might choke on her false teeth. He smiled encouragingly at, Rolly, Mocky, at Molly as she searched for her pyjamas. Rocky always knew how to cheer her up. He knew her well. And this is how. Both Molly and Rocky had arrived at Hardwick House ten summers ago, a white baby and a black baby. Molly had been found in a cardboard box on a doorstep by Miss Addiston, whilst Rocky had been found in the top part of a pram in the car park behind Briarsville Police Station. Found because he'd been heard yelling at the top of his voice. Miss Addiston didn't like babies. To her, they were noisy, smelly, squelchy creatures, and the idea of changing a nappy filled her with disgust. So Mrs Trinklebury, a shy widow from the town who had 
helped with the orphanage babies before, had been employed to look after Molly and Rocky. And because Mrs Trinkleby named children after the clothes or the carriers they arrived in, like Moses Wicker, who'd been found in a Moses basket, or Satin Knight, who'd come dressed in a satin nighty with satin ribbons, Molly and Rocky were given exotic names too. Molly's surname Moon had come from Moon's Marshmallows, which had been printed in pink and green on the sides of her cardboard box cradle. When Mrs Trinkleberry found a lolly stick in the box, she called the baby Lolly Moon. And after Miss Addiston forbade Lolly as a name, Lolly Moon became Molly Moon. Rocky's name came directly from his red pram. On its hood had been written the Scarlet Rocker. Rocky was solid in build, like a rock, and very calm. This calmness came from a dreamy quality he had. But it was different to Molly's. Molly daydreamed to escape, whereas Rocky's dreaminess was a sort of pondering as he wondered about the odd world he saw about him. Even as a baby, he could often be found lying happily in his cot, thinking and humming to himself. His deep husky voice together with his good looks made Mrs. Drinkleby say that one day he'd be a rock star, singing love songs to the ladies. So Rocky Scarlet, the name she had given him, given him turned out to suit him very well. Mrs. Drinkleby wasn't very clever, but her sweet centre made up for her simple nature. And it was very lucky she had nannied Molly and Rocky because with the only with only bitter Miss Addiston in charge, perhaps they would have grown up thinking the whole world was bad and have turned bad themselves. Instead, they were bounced on fat Mrs Trinkleby's knee and they fell asleep to her singing. From her they learned kindness. She made them laugh and wipe their eyes when they cried. And at night, if ever they asked why they had been doorstep babies, she told them, that they were orphans because a naughty cuckoo had knocked them out of their nests. Then she'd sing them a mysterious lullaby. It went like this. Forgive little birds that brown cuckoo for pushing you out of your nests. It's what Mama Cuckoo taught it to do. She taught it that pushing is best. If Molly or Rocky ever felt cross with their parents, whoever they were, for abandoning them, Mrs Trinkleby's song would make them feel better. But Mrs Trinkleby didn't live at the orphanage anymore. As soon as Molly and Rocky were out of nappies, she'd been sent away. Now she only came back once a week to help with the cleaning and the laundry. Molly and Rocky wished for more doorstep babies to arrive so that Mrs Trinkleby could return, but none ever came. Small children arrived, but walking and talking, and to save money, Miss Addiston used Molly and Rocky as nannies for them. Now Ruby, the youngest child in the orphanage, was five, and she had stopped wearing nappies ages ago, even at night. Night was drawing in. In the distance, Molly heard the muffled squawk of the cuckoo clock in Miss Addiston's rooms, striking six. Really late, she said, tearing her dressing gown from a hook on the door. She's going to have a tantrum, Rocky agreed as they sprinted down the passage. The two children sped expertly along the obstacle course that was the route downstairs, a journey they'd made thousands of times before. They skidded round a corner on the polished, polished linoleum floor and long jumped down the stairs. Quietly and out of breath, they tiptoed across the chequered stone floor of the hall, past the TV room and towards the oak panelled assembly room, they slunk in. Nine children, four of them under seven years old, were lined up along the walls. Molly and Rocky joined the end of a line, near two friendly five-year-olds, Ruby and Jinx, hoping that Miss Addiston hadn't reached their names on the register yet. Molly glanced at some of the unfriendly older faces opposite her, Hazel Hackersley, the meanest girl in the orphanage, narrowed her eyes at Molly 
and Gordon Boyles made the motion of cutting his throat with an imaginary knife. Ruby Abel, read Miss Addison. Yes, Miss Addison, piped up tiny Ruby beside Molly. Gordon Boyles? Here, Miss Addison, said Gordon, making a face at Molly. Jinx Eames. Ruby prodded Jinx in the ribs. Yes, Miss Addison, he answered. Roger Fibbin. Here, Miss Addison, said the tall, thin boy who stood next to Gordon, eyeing Molly maliciously. Hazel Hackersley. Here, Miss Addison. Molly was relieved. Her name was next. Jerry Oakley. Here, Miss Addison, said seven-year-old Jerry, thrusting his hand into his pocket where he could feel his pet mouse trying to escape. Cynthia Redman. Here, Miss Addison said Cynthia, winking at Hazel. Molly wondered what when her own name would pop up. Craig Redman? Here, Miss Addison, grunted Cynthia's twin. Miss Addison seemed to have forgotten Molly. She was relieved. Gemma Patel? Here, Miss Addison. Rocky Scarlet. Here, Rocky said, his voice wheezing. Miss Addison slammed the register shut. As usual, Molly Moon is not here. I am here now, Miss Addiston. Molly could hardly believe it. Miss Addiston must have read her name out first to intentionally catch her out. Now doesn't count, said Miss Addiston, her lips twitching. You will be on washing up duty tonight. Edna will be pleased to have the night off. Molly squeezed her eyes tight shut with regret. The idea that something special might happen to her tonight was fading fast. The evening was obviously going to be just like so many of the others, full of trouble. Evening vespers began as usual. This was when a hymn was sung and the prayers were said. Normally Rocky's voice boomed above everyone else's, but today he sang quietly, trying to get his breath back. Molly hoped he wasn't going to have a bad winter riddled with wheezing asthma attacks. And then the evening proceeded, as it always did, 365 days a year. After the last blessing prayer, the dinner gong sounded and the heavy dining room door swung open. Girls and boys shuffled through it, welcomed tonight by a disgusting smell of old fish. They'd seen the fish often enough lying in plastic crates in the alley outside the kitchen, scuttling with flies and beetles, smelling as if it had been there a week. And everyone knew that Edna, the orphanage cook, would have baked the fish in a thick, greasy, cheese and nut packet sauce to disguise its rotten taste, a trick that she'd learnt in the Navy. There Edna stood now, broad and muscly, with her curly grey hair and her flattened nose, ready to make sure that every child ate up. With a tattoo of a sailor on her thigh, although this was only a rumour, and her terrible language. Edna was like a grumpy pirate. Her temper lay like a sleepy dragon inside her, a temper that was fierce and fiery if woken up. Every single child felt nervous and sick as they stopped and stood in a queue and made their excuses while Edna slopped out smelly helpings. I'm allergic to fish, Edna. No, the bleeding codswallop, came Ed's, Edna's gruff reply as she wiped her nose on her overall sleeve. It is codswallop, Molly whispered to Rocky, looking down at her fish. The ordinary evening was nearly over. All that was left before bed was Molly's washing up punishment. As usual, Rocky offered to help her. We can make up a song about washing up. Besides, Upstairs, I'd only have Gordon and Roger trying to bait me. They're only jealous of you. Why don't you just go up and wallop them for once, said Molly. Oh, I can't be bothered. But you hate washing up, and so do you. You'll get over it quicker if I help you. And so on this ever so ordinary night, the pair set off for the basement pantry. But Molly had been right. A strange thing was going to happen tonight, and it was about to take place. It was cold in the basement, with dripping pipes overhead 
and vents in the walls that let in mouldy smelling cold air and mice. Molly turned on the tap, which spluttered lukewarm water, whilst Rocky went to fetch the washing up liquid. Molly could hear Edna's grumbling in the passage as she trundled the trolley load of eleven fishy plates down the tunnelled slope towards the pantry. Molly crossed her fingers that Edna would just leave the crockery trolley and go, though it was much more likely that she would come into the pantry and get cross. That was more Edna's style. Rocky arrived with washing up liquid. He squirted some into the sink, pretending in, he was one in one of their favourite TV adverts. Oh, Mama, he said to Molly, why are your hands so soft? So soft, Molly replied whimsically. It's because I use this washing up liquid, darling. Other brands are simply murderous, only Bubble a lot is kind. Suddenly, Edna's dinosaur hand came down on Molly's, shattering their make believe world. Molly shied sideways, expecting an earful of insults, but instead, a sickly, sweet voice said in her ear, I'll go and do that, dearie. Off you go now and play. Dearie? Molly didn't think she could have heard Edna right. Edna had never, ever spoken nicely to her. Normally, Edna was plain horrid and grisly, but now it, she was smiling an unnatural, snaggly tooth smile. But Miss Addiston, oh, don't you worry about her, said Edna. You just go and relax. Go and watch the lovely blasted telly or something. Molly looked at Rocky who was looking just as confused. They both looked at Edna. The change in her was amazing. As amazing as tulips growing out of the top of her head would have been. And that was the first strange happening of the week. And that is the end of chapter one. I'll read you chapter two next. Bye. Have a good day, a good evening, a good sleep, whatever you're doing. Next. Have a good time. Be happy. Happy hypnotizing. Bye.